Ticks can be found in our backyards, parks, and school grounds. And for thousands of Canadians, they can also be found in their workplace. Foresters, linesmen, landscapers, and tree planters are among the many outdoor workers who are at risk of encountering ticks in their day-to-day -day work. Even people who work indoors, such as veterinarians and pet groomers, are potentially exposed to this occupational hazard. In this podcast, we connect again with Tim Chida, a business operator in the reforestation industry. He has been an industry leader in raising awareness about tick-borne illnesses. We originally spoke to Tim two years ago in episode 21 about this occupational hazard and first aid processes that they had in place to keep their employees safe. Welcome back to the podcast, Tim. Oh, well, thank you for having me again. It's great to actually have you here in the studio with us. Thank you for coming in. I know, we're we're across from each other at a desk. Do you think workers in your industry, or tree planters in particular, are becoming more aware of ticks and Lyme disease since we last spoke two years ago? <laughs> since we last spoke, I, I do hear from contractors and, and the industry that there's a lot more conversation around it including at our uh, AGM, we've had uh, booths set. There's been booths, I think, from Can Lime there. So we're seeing an increase in awareness. Whether or not that's at the place that it needs to be yet, I don't think we're quite there, but there's certainly an increase. That's great. And do you know of many tree planters who have had tick bites or that have been diagnosed with Lyme disease? I, I've seen a number of tick bites over the last couple of years now. And... I've heard of planters, other planters that have been diagnosed with Lyme um, that have been past planters. So haven't had any encounter of any acute diagnosis of Lyme during the season as of yet, which is good news. Yeah, you know, because I remember when I was tree planting in the early 90s, um, I don't remember ever, anyone ever having ticks or seeing them in cut blocks. Mm -mm. That was mostly Northern Ontario, but it was not really a thing then. So I'd be curious if they're now in that area. Well, I, all these years that I've worked in the bush, so 36 years, up until I started paying attention to it, I've never seen one tick or heard of ticks on anybody. Yeah. Now that we've started um, bringing it to awareness, we're starting to see at least multiple reports of ticks on people without being embedded and only a few embedded ticks Wow. Per, per year. So I think once we start looking for them, we're going to see that they're there and they're everywhere. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, you know, even just talking to you now, it takes me back to my days planting. And I remember, you know, so many people had dogs too, and we were all living in tents and, you know, your dog's crawling in with you. So I think it is really important that people have that awareness, do a quick, you know, check your armpits and your groin and your head and back of your knees. You know, it doesn't take much to do that. Well, I think I think that might be at the conclusion of this. One of the most important things that we're doing is being proactive in self checking and even having partners check and every day mm -hmm. because the biggest part of all this is to prevent ticks from embedding on you. And if you self check and you're aware to self check, that's that in 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 any industry you're in that you're going to be exposed to ticks is going to be the most important thing to do and and even recreationally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think part of this too is I don't feel that a uh, medical profession or even general public is aware of how consequential Lyme possibly can be and potentially can be. Mm -hmm. And so if people are aware of that, then, and we bring that to awareness, not to frighten anyone, but exactly. just go, just check yourself. I'm all about empowering people with knowledge. And I think that if people were aware that they had a sudden onset of strange symptoms, and then if they were actually treated with the right treatment and they felt a difference, you know, because when I first was bitten, I was treated and I felt better, but they didn't know what it was, even though I was treated mm -hmm. with doxycycline. And when that wore off, you know, that was another cue that maybe something was going on and they should have continued my you know, my treatment with mm -hmm. the doxycycline, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> well, how long it's going to tie into some of the recommendations, not being a doctor, can't mm -hmm. make recommendations, right. but curious, how long did you treat with doxycycline for? Oh my goodness. That's so long ago now. I can't even remember, but at the beginning it was 10 days and it wasn't right. long enough. Yeah, and so I was like 50% better after 10 days. And then I just went downhill. Yeah. And then I, yeah. I think that's going to be part of what, 
industry needs to do is because we're not going to educate the medical system on this. It's a it, that's going to be a slow process to understanding both treatment and um, I think proximity of of that infestation when you're out in the field. And so, one thing that we can do as employers is educate our employees on potentially some acute treatment that needs to be done or should be done. Mm -hmm. And we can get more into that, but they then can talk with their doctors about it when they, if they have an embedded tick. Yeah, definitely. Now I know this was part of our last conversation and you and I both know Justin Wood, who's the founder of Genetics. Um, and part of what Can Lyme has done is helped fund the Statistics Center, which is basically where they've amalgamated all the data that's being collected um, when people have given consent to share that data, they've we've created maps. So you can now mm -hmm. see it's not live every day, but every year we update those maps. And so we are seeing changes in tick. Well, part of it is the human awareness that they submit the ticks because if they, it's not a surveillance thing. It's based on ticks that are submitted. Um, but, you know, how are people in the industry, are they aware of the expansion of tick habitat or, like, are they tracking tick bites? Like you mentioned, more people are seeing them crawling them on their, on their body. Are they documenting bites and stuff like that? Or? Well, I know as my company, we do document bites mm -hmm. and have those stats. Awesome. And talking to other companies, I'm getting a wide range of whether they're aware or or even taking in that data. And right. I think some are and some aren't. It'd be really great to get the industry to a place where we're just by process and protocol taking that data in. Definitely. As one. And if you look back a few years ago, we would have maybe five years ago went, well, there's no Borrelia, there's no Lyme in Northern BC. Mm -hmm. Now with this mapping as an example, you can see that that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where Justin's works really very, very good to go. There's totally. actually Lyme here. Then we can share with our employees in certain regions um, the the severity of that in that region. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, the other great thing about that statistics center is you can also see all the green dots, which are ticks that were tested that are clean and don't have pathogens in them. So that yeah. is really important to know for people too. Like, just because you get bitten by a tick doesn't mean you've been exposed to pathogens. And that's why it's so important to keep the tick and test the tick. Absolutely. Yeah, because we don't mind taking them apart to see what's inside them, but it's a lot harder to do with humans. Crushing them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so let's go back to keeping the okay. tick. So if we're, yep. we're going to like really emphasize that sure. and look at industry protocol, that's something that I think it's absolutely imperative that that, tick is kept. Not only kept, but I think it should be standard protocol in industry mm -hmm. that if there's an embedded tick on a person, that that tick does get sent away for a um, PCR testing, so a genetic testing. So mm -hmm. that way you can look at the tick and go, well, is there even any sort of pathogen within this tick? And if I have some sort of clinical um, change, you know, what do I actually have to address? So exactly. having that tick, keeping that tick is really important and sending that tick away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And we'll come back to that sort of near the end of our conversation here. So let's be clear. You sold your business recently. I did, so yeah. So congratulations. I thank but you. But you also helped establish really great protocols to keep employees safe when working in, the, in that environment, which is fabulous. And I assume they'll continue probably doing that. Yeah, I talked to Jason yesterday before I come in on here and just got a review and go, what are you guys doing now in this whole mm -hmm. process and keeping that same process. And it's in all of their training, working with genetics, sending the ticks away. I think um, some of just maintaining that leadership from going, Hey, this is our standard protocol that if there's embedded tick, we're going to pay for that tick being mm -hmm. analyzed. So you have as an employee, you have the data to go, okay, what can I do with this? That's great. So yeah. you guys actually do the training with your employees ahead of time and you also pay for the tick testing if they have a tick embedded. Absolutely. So that's awesome. Like, I don't know how many other com companies do that. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Hopefully there's going to be a few, but I think that that's really, if we're going to be serious about that care relationship of employees coming out into the field and planting trees, because mm -hmm. it's brutal enough, let's yeah. make sure that we, as part of the cost of doing business, pay for that cost of doing testing on embedded ticks. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's hard work, but it's also so much fun. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. <laughs> I have small moments of missing it. <laughs> I bet you do. Like, you know, it's that magical forgetting. Yeah. You know, just like, yeah. that's why people go back. You, yeah, you're just so connected to nature every day. Every day yeah. you see something extraordinary. Oh, I think I had the best job in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when I was doing research, I found an interesting note on the QP Union website. And just for our listeners, um, QP is the Canadian Union of Public Employees. And I was surprised to find that they're actually <clears throat> alerting their members to the risks of Lyme disease. And do you agree? Like, do we agree that this is probably a step in the right direction, that the unions are acknowledging this? Well, I don't know necessarily saying that it's unions acknowledging mm -hmm. it. I think we as industry right. have to acknowledge it. Yeah. And I think more than as industry, I think that as even just general public to be aware of how severe Lyme disease truly can be. And if we do that, it's not a large cost to just put in a, protocols in place that really reduce that risk of Lyme disease. Because um, union being aware, I think everyone needs to be aware. And mm -hmm. when we're aware, it's it's fairly simple what we have to do. Yep, definitely. Um, and so it kind of leads into my next question, which was going to go more into first aid and stuff like that. But, um, you know, sometimes when you have this rapid onset of symptoms, sometimes they're neurological too, and you really need another person to help assess what's going on with you. At least that was my case. I was mm. so confused and disoriented and I was having a hard time speaking. Like mm -hmm. it was really scary. And so, you know, maybe not at that stage, but even now when people contact me and they're like, oh my gosh, I got bit by a tick or my dog, you know, they're in a panic mode. So mm -hmm. we want people... That's where if we can train first aid attendants, you know, like, stay calm, stay cool, everything's okay here, we know what to do. And that's where if people can be educated and advanced, mm -hmm. or if first aid attendants can deal with it in a cool, calm way, like, hey, we know what to do here, we're going to remove the tick properly, we're going to send it for testing. Um, do you think it's a good idea for first aid attendants to be carrying tick removal kits, or, or can we train employees to do that themselves? I think think that more than first aid attendants should be carrying tick removal kits. But if the first aid attendant is present, of course, in industry at all times, they're going to be there. But having uh, supervisors and foremen have tick removal kits is essential. Yeah, great. I think really training people to just keep the tick. That's mm -hmm. it. Put it in a baggie, put it in the freezer. Well, that's and even that's... You know, that's sometimes hard too. Like people remove ticks and then they drop them and you're in the gravel and you can't find the tick, you know? So, I mean, even that's important, right? Like maybe stick down a tarp and do it on that. So when it falls, you can see where if yeah. you drop it. Okay, different process. Yeah. Remove the tick. <laughs> uh-huh. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. Put it in a baggie. <laughs> put it in the freezer. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. That easy. Yeah. But I mean, I know people that have had that happen. I like had it I removed happen. it and I then it's gone. Yeah. And now it's like maybe crawling around your house. I don't know. Yeah, and then I, think, I always start scratching at this point. I start getting itchy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned the neurological symptoms. That's not going to happen after you get bitten by a tick. No, not that quickly. So looking at some of those symptoms of what may happen after being bitten by a tick, but a few days after you may develop a rash, like a bullseye rash in that location. I'm sure you've talked about that many times mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And then you can have other um, clinical symptoms of fatigue, um, nausea, uh, sleep issues, mm -hmm. and that can present shortly after. Yeah. So I think the clinical symptoms are part of being aware. The um, the genetic PCR testing is a step in that after sending the tick away because mm -hmm. you kept it and didn't drop it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, you have data to go, well, should I or should I not be on a course of antibiotics for four to six weeks? Right. Yeah. And that's where educating doctors to be able to just prescribe antibiotics four to six weeks. And when that data comes back, let's say there's no PCR evidence of pathogens in, in the tick and there's no clinical symptoms, then stop antibiotics because antibiotics are concerning in themselves. And right. if there's no evidence that you need them, then don't use them. Yeah, yeah. And again, disclaimer, I am not giving any medical advice. And no, I'm not a that's doctor. right. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been through hell with Lyme also. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that you and I, we can do to help share with people that awareness. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think we both just know that early intervention is very critical, early treatment. Yeah. Yeah, early diagnosis. But you asked about the industry earlier, and I do feel industry is on the right track. And in everyone I spoke to, people are aware now of Lyme disease. You look at five years ago and people, you know, there were people that didn't even know about Lyme disease or had a protocol for tick removal in their first aid. I don't, that's just not the case anymore. Mm -hmm, Exactly. We all have it. Yeah. What we do with it and how we implement it is really, I think, the next level of maturing industry Mm -hmm. and just to make it as a uh, protocol for that PCR testing would be a huge step. Yep, definitely. Yeah, and just so our listeners are aware, um, Can Lime, the way that Can Lime primarily raises money as a nonprofit is by selling tick removal kits. Mm. And uh, Can Lime does give discounts for bulk orders to industry. And actually, that's how they sell a lot of the tick removal kits is, you know, two different industries. So mm. if people are interested, they can contact us through the website and order kits for their employees and keep them in their trucks or have them in their backpacks or Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, So when I was uh, doing my research, I saw an announcement that in New York, lawmakers are considering making Lyme disease an occupational illness under workers' compensation. And I actually thought one of the provinces in the Maritimes had done the same thing, but I didn't find it. So if anyone's aware of it, they can email it to us. Um, But have you heard stories about employees accessing workers' compensation here in BC? I don't think we're there yet. No, I haven't heard of this. But, I mean, it's interesting to see. I mean, obviously, New York State, the whole eastern states have been, and Mm -hmm. the Maritimes have been dealing with this a lot longer than we have here in BC. Yeah, with exponentially more cases. Yeah. So there's a lot more data there and a lot more history there. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I I didn't get bitten at work, but I did need to take a medical leave. And honestly, the process was so humiliating and it was just entirely not supportive. And so mm-hmm. if I had gotten sick at work, I would probably be pretty upset, you know? And I, th- I think it's good that they're developing processes to take care of people. And I hope that that <laughs> really rolls out. Well, I think if we start looking at data documenting and then doing PCR testing, at least there's a lot more information there for um, timeline of, you know, that vector being transferred Mm -hmm. Yeah, for one. But at the same time, when all that's done, the probability of having Lyme is so greatly reduced. Yeah. So I think no matter what's happening with WCB, that's a very separate issue from here. Uh, And if work-related events are work-related events, there, there there needs to be some sort of addressing of that, I believe. Yeah. But I think first and foremost, as industry, that we need to look at preventative measures and then um, acute process for how to address them, and then potentially education on acute treatment. Because Great. as you said, 10 days wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. And if you would have done four to six weeks, probability, at least for Borrelia, that that would have been brought down. It's almost like, you know what I'm going to say next. So, (laughs) um, again, when I was doing my research, I found the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And, you know, what they were writing on their website was they were saying that doctors are able to make a clinical diagnosis. But I know that most doctors in Canada are not yet trained to make a clinical diagnosis. And I just want our listeners to be clear that a clinical diagnosis means that a doctor can make a diagnosis based on your signs, your symptoms, and your specific patient history. And I do have good news, though, and that is that for anyone working in the healthcare field or any physicians that would like to get additional training, CanLime is still offering grants to attend any of the training with ILADS, whether that's online or at the conference. And we'll put a link to the show notes in there because we really uh, want to support physicians to feel that they have um, access to adequate training. So, Tim, what has your experience been? Through my journey in Lyme, I, I experienced that some doctors don't believe Lyme to be consequential from an immune response perspective, and that even 10 days of antibiotics for chronic Lyme will be adequate. But what I've seen traveling around the world is that anyone that's been out there finding a, trying to find a solution for their health concerns has experienced 10 to 20 to 30 doctors mm-hmm. all saying, no, you don't have Lyme. Right. So then when you go through this and then you actually go through treatment that's, that works, which I did, 
um, felt over uh, a three day period going, okay, this fog's actually lifted after three months of right. heavy treatment. Yeah. You have some, at least, uh, well, you have some data and evidence to go, hang on, there, there is treatment. And there is testing. It's just we may not be having the most de- detailed testing in Canada. Right. So one of those tests that, that again, if you have um, potential Lyme or concerned about Lyme, Armin Labs out of Germany, probably mm-hmm. some of the best testing in the world. Yeah. And so to start with testing um, and then to start with educating your doctor. And yeah, there's still, I, I believe, a, um, a bias out there in the collective that Lyme's not not real. Right. So if that's there, how does the doctor do clinical diagnosis? Right. Yeah. So it has to speak out. There's a big gap there. (laughs) There's a, there's a gap. And I mean, you and I have also, you know, taken out big loans to pay privately for our own healthcare. I know we spoke about that last time, 300, $400,000. Like most Canadians can't afford that. So really the purpose of having these conversations is to try to bring that good care we have access through the private system and hopefully bring it into the public health care system so that everyone can access the good services that we've been able to access. Right. By selling our homes. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. Well, imagine the impact that could be made on the expense of long-term chronic treatment and reducing that if there's just short-term, um, a short-term acute treatment Mm-hmm. Four to six weeks of doxycycline or amoxicycline, yeah. yeah, and and looking at that, if doctors knew that that could be preventative, mm-hmm. the expense that could save and and the well the the suffering that would absolutely impact would be incredible. All right. Well, I apologize if we're getting too political there, listeners, but you know some things just have to be said sometimes. Um, I just want to circle back to our conversation about genetics. So uh, you're no longer an owner of a company, but what value do you see for tick testing um, for employers in the natural resource sector? For employers? Yeah. Like taking that responsibility to pay for the testing if they're finding embedded ticks. Well, I think, you know, in, in any industry, in planting, when you're working, we're not, I'd always say we're not a tree planting company, we're a people company. Mm-hmm. That's it. You know, look, you look at the culture of what tree planters, what we do together out there, and we're a community and in some sense, a long lost community, something that we're all longing for. Yeah. And tree planting, you wake up every day, you get out of your tent, you're almost like you're, you're in a community where you recognize the same faces every day and you have the hardship. So there's no hiding who you are. You right. just are raw, <laughs> yes. human smelliness, <laughs> <laughs> which is incredibly wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, so too. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it changes us. Ways it's a rite of re- passage. It's a rite of passage. She <laughs> reminds us, you know, that community that we're all so longing for is, is there in tree planting. Exactly. Yeah. So in that, you know, what value does it bring? It, it, you know, it's about caring for each other. Mm. So I think when we stop looking at um, business as only function is bottom line, because that's what, in my experience in business, that's not what the first function was. The first function is, what are we doing here together? And then when we do it together well, how does that generate bottom line? Yeah. And in that, part of doing it together well is about creating um, authentic community, which involves predictability and safety and care. And that's what process should really be about, mm-hmm. is that safety and predictability and care that's within community. And if that's what you're first goal is the other stuff happens within business and bottom line well generate itself and planters well generate a lot of money planting trees and that's what your goal is as well you can't separate those two but the first one being care and if the first one is care then what do we need to do as part of the cost of doing business in order to bring that care for uh, Lyme disease and tick-borne illness and one of those costs has to be testing and ticks. That's great. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate that perspective. It's, yeah, yeah. it's very holistic. Um, and then do you have any other closing comments or anything for other advice for employers or just any other conversations? Go tree planting. Go tree planting. It's, and I know you spoke brilliant. to Dr. Sperling this morning as well. Yeah, Jen is amazing. Yeah, to- so Janet Sperling is the president of the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation. It was interesting. We started getting into this conversation about the detail of 
diagnostic tools and how do we split things further and further and further when you know passed into PCR testing and then the data she's looking at for DNA and then different types of Borrelia. And I said something like, it seems like the more we split this apart that there's no solution. But Janet just went so unequivocally, of course there's a solution. And nice. we're almost there, but we need more funding for our research because mm -hmm. it's fairly complicated when she starts talking about the, the RNA and different pathogens and how we're starting she's starting to determine and and analyze them but she just needs we need to have some more funding in this because i think in the funding of this sort of understanding on chronic disease lyme being one of those chronic diseases it's going to just lend lead us into so much more understanding about our overall health which ties into many other things happening in the world right now. Absolutely. And so supporting Janet and her work and um, Justin and his work and then industry. And I am saying just spending time over the last um, few days again, reaching out to uh, my colleagues. We're so much more aware of mm -hmm. Lyme and tick-borne illness than yeah. we were five years ago or two years ago. It's wonderful. It's, yeah. inc it's really incredible. That's great. But now standardizing a process for that uh, diagnostic tool so that we know how to do true, proper, the best we can acute treatment. Again, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> is is the next step. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that collaboration. I mean, that's really how we move things forward. Yeah. So thank you. I really appreciate you coming into the studio today. And uh, thank you for all your leadership so far and taking a stand and, and sharing your experience. Well, it's been a great journey. Thanks for having me again. What a great interview, and I love the concept of taking care of each other and creating community. Go tree planting! Get out there, plant trees. Have a buddy system. Make sure you check for ticks. Help each other out. And remember, you know, it's, it's tree planting. It is an initiation into a new place in your lives. It's not summer camp, so go tree planting. It's a great industry. <laughs> go tree planting and stay safe in the outdoors. Yeah.